Good evening, Matanistas. Welcome back to Manchester. I'm not in Turkey anymore. I am in Manchester's Chinatown. And I always bring you, as you know, a pre-match food segment. Today, I'm going to bring you something rather special, a Sichuan Chinese meal. And why something special, you ask? Because tonight is something special. The World Cup's over, we're back to the real business of club football, and what a Christmas cracker we have for you today, the Carabao Cup game between Manchester City and Liverpool. Let's do it. <laughs> with a group of friends, some of whom I meet at various conferences, and some who I've just met through being friends of friends, and most of them are actually Liverpool supporters. But it's always very good to fraternise with the opposing supporters and talk with them about football and everything else in life. But rather than poking my camera around and making a commentary on each and every of this massive spread of dishes that I'm about to order, I thought, no, I'm going to bring you video clips with my voiceover so I don't interfere with everybody's meal. But for communal eating and sharing, this sort of food is absolutely unrivaled. Now, something that's actually a bit confusing about this restaurant is the name of the restaurant. Is it this Chuan Guojiang? Is it... Mr. Hong Beef Noodles. And the easiest way of finding this restaurant is to look for the massive car park in the middle of Chinatown, the Pay On Arrival car park, bang opposite to the left of the May Dim restaurant, with these Chinese characters on a black background. Up the stairs you go, and you'll see an unmistakable Sichuan selection of dishes on the displayed menu and you'll know where you are. They have two menus, a red menu and a blue menu. The red menu has all the sort of westernised Chinglish favourites, but for those of you who are gastronauts, you want the blue menu with all the Sichuan specialities. And Matanistas, you'll know you're in the right place because you'll probably be the only non-Chinese people in the restaurant. <laughs> Wow, what a great feed that was, Matanistas. Sorry I couldn't bring you the live coverage of the food, as it were, but I can assure you, you'll have a great meal if you go there and try and go in as big a group as possible because the more the merrier in terms of dishes that you can share. This sort of food always best eaten communally rather than people choosing their own dish. Great to be back in the pub with all the banter and chat before a football match. A busy pub at that, pints flying out everywhere. And at the moment, I'm in a place called the Old Monkey. Quite a traditional pub owned by the Joseph Holtz chain, who serves some of the cheapest beer in Manchester. Now, I think today's game is actually quite hard to call. When asked for a prediction, I thought 2-1 to City, but obviously there are some great offensive players who will be on display from either side. Don't forget both Harlan 
Ireland and Salah missed out on the World Cup. Kevin De Bruyne came back early, as did a lot of Liverpool players. So I'll go into more about how I think the evening is going to play out when we actually have the team news, because until we know which of the World Cup players are coming back, it's going to be very hard to know who's going to win this game. I think it's going to be hard enough to predict it even then, with some of my friends here predicting a penalty shootout. Now, a lot of you have been asking me a ton of questions about the World Cup, which is now finished. I will, in future matches, maybe dwell on it a little bit about how it might be affecting City or opponents that we come across, but this will be my last talk in any sort of detail about the World Cup, because I don't like the fact that it may well overshadow the domestic season. We might be talking about Messi being the greatest in May, well after he's been knocked out of every competition there is other than maybe the French League. Of course, that might not be the case. To try and answer as many of your questions as possible, well, first of all, it shouldn't have been held in Qatar. The biggest reason, of course, being that the World Cup is supposed to be a vehicle to promote football in places where it hasn't taken a hold, either through people watching it on the television, people being able to go and attend games, or because the local supporters get a chance to see the top international players. And unfortunately, Qatar, and it's a place I've visited a lot and stop over because I love their airline, very comfortable place to stop, it actually ticks none of those boxes. A lot of viewers were watching on television at odd times of the day. Ticketing was appalling. I don't know how teams like Senegal, Argentina and Morocco managed to get half the tickets for each game because I can assure you trying to get hold of England tickets was close to impossible. Could have gone to the Iran game and that was it. And the population of Qatar itself is tiny. In fact, possibly they reckon a quarter of their population or native Qatari population was sat in the stadium for the game against Ecuador in the opening fixture. And most of them left at half time when they were 2 0 down. The last minute changes on the alcohol rules. Oh, if you paid a lot for your ticket and were in a corporate area, of course you could get as much alcohol as you wanted. But I'm afraid for something like that, it has to be available. As do rights for LGBT people, they had to ignore their law officially. I know they said they turn a blind eye to it, but can't exclude people of any orientation from such an important global event. And the responsibility there lies with FIFA. Need a quick slurp when I'm ranting away like this. Of course there were lots of criticisms about the construction workers, the deaths, their rights, their working conditions and so on and so forth. But I also have to point out a massive Western double standard here. First of all, FIFA could have leaned more heavily on Qatar to clean up those things before awarding them the competition. To an extent, they did at least improve some of the workers' rights. And when it comes to the construction deaths and the withholding of passports, and stuff again improve but we cannot be people to tell them about this because in the UK we also have deaths at the workplace and our record is pretty shabby there okay nowhere near as bad but we're in no position to criticize these people politicians tennis players other sportsmen other prominent people go to Qatar to perform meet basically do deals which earn them money they never get it in the neck so why football and footballers and my final point by the way to go back to the fans from various countries getting so many tickets and filling so many stadiums is that if you have a world cup in europe or north america a lot of these people they can't just get in they can't get visas they're not allowed in or at the very best they have to jump through hoops to get into these countries so as usual a ton of hip hypocrisy and double standards at work. Anyway, I'll be back with you with the team news and my thoughts on how the match is going to play out. So the team news is indeed out and City have fielded probably a stronger lineup as they possibly could have done. A lot of our stars are on the bench, but De Bruyne is playing, Haaland's playing, Gundogan's playing. At the back, slightly unusually, our back four is Rico Lewis, who's made a very promising start to his career at City. Also, Aki, I think, is playing left back, which is a little bit odd, with a more familiar pairing at centre-half of Akanji and 
Laporte, both of whom did play at the World Cup, but were knocked out at the round of 16, along with Rodri, who will be our central midfield defensive pivot, again knocked out in the round of 16. The players who were knocked out in the quarter-final are either on the bench or are not playing, like, for example, Grealish and Foden. Liverpool, meanwhile, do not have Virgil van Dijk back. They don't have Alisson either, although they're reserve keeper with an Irish name that I can't pronounce. I think it's Elleher, is it? He's not bad, actually. He's pretty good at stopping penalties, so we don't really want it to go that far. In midfield, some guy called Bicetic. I don't know him. For all I know, he might be the best thing since sliced bread that's about to come through. But I think, comparatively, given that, of course, Mo Salah, or Salad as we call him, starts at front with Carvalho and Nunes. I'm not sure how strong a front three that is. No Firmino, although he didn't play in the World Cup, so I don't know what's happened to him. I think all of this gives City an advantage, and I'm sticking with my prediction of a narrow City win tonight. <laughs> Well, I'm so glad I did go early. The trams were a mess. They kept getting stuck. Christmas shoppers going on to football trams. Queues outside the ground. And just about time for a very swift half before the game. Well, the trams were mad. The queues were mad. Only time for the swiftest of swift halves before we started. But glad to be here. Great atmosphere. Can't show you the Liverpool fans because they're right on top of me. I must say, I think I've been relocated to exactly the same place as I did against Chelsea in the last round of the competition. Go on, Kev. Both sides have had their moments in this game so far. None more so than Cole Palmer with that horrible miss set up by a great run by Haaland. But don't worry, Lennon and McCartney got together again. De Bruyne to Haaland. He got in front of the defender. He didn't miss. 1-0 City. I know the back fours are a bit experimental, but nobody got to the ball and nobody was picking up Carvalho, so you deserve to concede if you do that. One all. Great move, but let's face it, that should have been a goal. Good save by the keeper, but you just really have to score from that. Should have been him. Go on. Oh! Go on. John Allen. Oh, good piece of defending, though. Half-time, City 1, Liverpool 1. 
I have to say City had the better of that but missed quite a few good chances that the worst miss coming from Cole Palmer not sure what he was trying to do there but neither would he probably when he looks at the replay unfortunately only one of these big chances came to the man who can really bang them away Erling Haaland I suspect if he gets another couple of chances he'll score another but for the time being Palmer and particularly Mares again need to step up to the plate and improve a lot of good situations are wasted by Maris. I understand everybody's just getting back together after the World Cup. Entertaining game though, and Liverpool a very dangerous side on the counter, as we've seen over the years and today. And I think Klopp will try and go for it just after half time, simply because if you look at what City have on the bench, it's much, much stronger than anything Liverpool have. Anyway, anybody's game, all to play for, and let's hope down here where the service is better, I'll get my half time pint no point for me maybe the end was slightly emptier against Chelsea I don't know maybe people had working days and it wasn't near Christmas but anyway let's enjoy the second half Well, maybe that big cue for the beer was a blessing in disguise. Nice work down the left, another sumptuous ball in, and Mares of all people took it down beautifully round the defender and bent it round the keeper. 2-1 City. Oh, that was a bit of a joke, I just got my camera to it. Are they trying to play a World Cup final replay and go to 3-3 in penalties? Oh dear, that defending was cringeworthy. One might wonder what Ortega was doing allowing such an easy tap in. I love your hat mate. Thank you. Humdinger of a game this is, great cross from De Bruyne, delicious cross and this time Ake put it past the grasping arms of Kelleher who couldn't stop it this time, 3-2 City and I'm losing my voice. What's he doing free there? Help him! Seventy-three minutes gone, and City being a bit sloppy in possession. Liverpool had that chance, but I'm sure that was offside. So, seventeen to go, and we need to be careful in possession. That is the most important thing. Again, when you see Mares or Grealish in positions like that, you always expect there to be no end product. Oh, it's getting a bit tasty in there.
Well, Matanistas, I promised you a Christmas cracker and a Christmas cracker we did get tonight. What a game of football we got. Yes, both attacks on top of both defences who were a bit shoddy tonight, but still very entertaining and a great welcome back to the club season. Who needs the World Cup with games like that? I'm back in the monk after more than a month away and I did say that that game against Brentford where we lost 2-1 before the break for the World Cup left a bad taste in the mouth. Players with World Cupitis or whatever you want to call it but today that game has taken the taste away. And City started off like a house on fire. Palmer should have put City ahead. That was a terrible miss from a great assist from Haaland. Put it on a plate, really. But then Haaland did the business himself from another great ball from Kevin De Bruyne. Gomez didn't know where Haaland was. And before he knew it, Haaland had zipped in and got in front of him to slot the ball home to make it 1-0. It did feel that City could have added to their lead at that point. But Liverpool did come back. And and Liverpool did put a very good move together, I thought. I think that there was a lack of tracking runners at the end. I don't think Fabio Carvalho should have been given oceans of space that he was given. Very nice finish and a very nice cross from the evergreen James Milner. But you've got to track the runners. That was pretty poor, I thought, from the City defence. Couldn't see who was responsible because it was right at the other end of the pitch. But City had some great chances to make it 2-1 before the half, with Kelleher, the goalkeeper for Liverpool, making some very good saves. Liverpool's main threat, I would have thought it would be Salah before the game, but it turned out to be Nunez, who put on some blistering runs of pace and took up some great positions, only then to keep dragging his shots wide. And I actually thought, because of the strength of the benches, that Liverpool would come storming out after the break, but instead it was City who did so. I got the assist wrong, it was Rodri who lofted the ball over to Mares, and for all my criticism, and he did mess up some good openings, or was unproductive when in good positions in the first half, but boy, he took that one down well and finished it superbly. But only a couple of minutes later, City were caught out again. It was a good move again. It was a good ball forward. And Nunes was too hot pace-wise for Laporte to deal with. However, I don't think Ake did particularly well in his marking of Salah. I thought the move had been messed up because I think Nunes should have got a quick shot away. I'm not sure why Ake allowed Salah to get goal side of him very briefly. And I'm not sure why the keeper was taking up the position of Alan Ruff, the famous Scottish keeper, to allow a simple tap-in when he was still obviously expecting a shot from a player who'd already passed the ball. And then, of course, the winner, another sumptuous De Bruyne ball, and I think this is a very positive sign for City because he seems to have got his mojo back after he came in for quite a lot of criticism in the World Cup and a really good header from Ake to finish. Goalkeeper had no chance there. I was a bit worried we'd make another defensive error and let Liverpool back in again. Well, Nunes did get clear again and dragged his shot wide. I thought that was miles offside. I'll have to check it. I guess the fact that the flag didn't go up means it can't have been miles offside. Thankfully, Nunes messed it up anyway. City had some more chances to put the game out of Liverpool's reach, but that was the end of the scoring, and at least we didn't make any defensive errors, which would have ended up with the game being decided by a penalty shootout, which we wouldn't want. Also, a bit hard to know what to take from that, because City's regular starting lineup will not look like that at all. I thought Rico Lewis had a pretty good game again at fullback, whereas Cole Palmer wasn't his best game. But the fact he's appearing in some starting lineups does mean that he's probably impressed in training. Grealish and Bernardo both came on and played little cameos, so it's positive news that they might be ready to play the next league game. Maybe it'll be two league games time before they're ready to play a full 90. And I guess the next games will neither be as end-to-end -end as that, or against such tricky customers as Liverpool, who are always dangerous, even though they're going through a rough patch at the moment. Those quick counters, they could have forced that game to penalties quite easily.
And as for Liverpool, their makeshift midfield was overrun pretty early, but they managed to hang in there, hold firm after the first goal went in, and get back into the game twice. And up front, I noticed a lot of flicks and layoffs from Salah were ending up going to City defenders. Not sure he was quite at the races, or was it that his teammates weren't on the same wavelength as him? I thought he looked a bit rusty, to be honest. Although nothing's certain in this game, I expect them to put a big run together in the second half of the season and comfortably qualify in the top four for next season's Champions League. And of course, a lot depends on what happens in the January transfer window. I think usually after World Cups, a lot of panic buys are made and people do forget that the standard of club games is often higher than internationals and people who have starred at the World Cup, well, they might not be able to do it at club level. The history of the game is littered with people who were bought after a couple of good performances in a World Cup and then can't cut it at a club. And the draw has come out for the quarter-final, which is going to take place in just over a fortnight, I think. And City have been drawn away at Southampton. In terms of the quality of the opposition, it's an OK draw. It's like a middling draw because it's away. I would have said Southampton at home would have been a great draw. I would expect a win, but you never know. Southampton could put on a sterling performance and knock us out. But the big thing for me is that I want to go, but it might be a bit of a pain in the ass to get down there. So I'm going to have to love you and leave you again, Matanistas. Boy, oh boy, am I looking forward to the rest of the domestic and European season. If De Bruyne and Haaland are firing like that for the rest of the season, as City fans, we have so much to look forward to. But until then, keep liking, keep sharing, keep subscribing, and most of all, don't forget... You can't beat a bit of mutton.